Hello and welcome to Moderate Fantasy Violence, a podcast about pop culture and the world around it. I'm Alistair. And I'm Nick. And today we'll be discussing Lego Batman, the new sci-fi TV show Legion, and Danny Boyle's train spotting sequel T2. Also, Nick has been watching Lars von Trier's hospital horror show Kingdom, and we'll be finding out what he thought about it later in the show. But first, Nick, what have you been up to since we last spoke? Uh, well, long-term listeners might remember I said I was going to try and read more books, so I'm going to report that I have successfully read another book. In fact, I've read another three books, but two of them were like novellas. The longer one I've read, which did take me about two and a half weeks to get through, was Angel Maker by Nick Harkaway, which you can't see, but I'm holding it up to the microphone for absolutely no reason, because this is not a visual podcast. I can't see the book. No, we can't, we, you can't see the book. It does have a very attractive cover, so in some ways it's a shame you can't see the book. Anyway, yeah, it, it's about Joe Spork, the son of an infamous criminal, well, an infamous old-school London gangster called Matthew Tommy Gun Spork, who has been trying to stay out of his father's business and become a, a clockwork engineer, but finds himself drawn back into it when he gets called to fix a mysterious clockwork machine that turns out to be some sort of doomsday device. And then there's a a secondary plot involving a, an elderly woman called Edie Bannister, who turns out to have been a spy. And basically, it's a very sort of pulpy trope combining novel with sort of gangster stuff, spy stuff, sort of steampunky clockwork sci fi stuff. It's it's fun, it's really fun. It sort of combines it all in a very sort of gleeful way. Possibly a bit long for such a fun, zippy novel, but nonetheless, I enjoyed it quite a lot. That sounds really good. Actually, yeah, a very clever idea. Yeah, yeah, and there's also some sort of lengthy flashbacks to Edie Bannister's spy career when she fights this big, big, important supervillain who predictably turns out to have some role to play in the ongoing plot as well. And Yeah, it's good. Uh, Nick Harkaway is, is a good author. He also has another book called The God Away World, which I read, it must be about eight years ago now. That's a sort of dystopian road trip novel. That was excellent. My memory had faded a bit, but I, I remember really, really enjoying that as well. So yeah, I think either one of those books is... Worth a look if you two are trying to read more books in the new year. So yes, Nick's Book Club, still going after one and a half months. Glad to hear it. Yep, anyway, so that's me. What have you been doing? Well, in a shocking reversal, I've been reading a comic since... Fuck, uh, Fuck yes. Yes, it's working. Your your power over me to get me to read comics is uh, is working. My hypnotic power where we agree to do stuff and then you do it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's funny how, um, how that influences my ability to do things. I've been reading Mouse by Art Spiegelman. For those who don't know, it's a, I think a very famous graphic novel. It tells the story of Art's father, who was a Jew who lived in uh, Czechoslovakia and Poland during the 1930s and 40s. And it, the, it tells the story of the rise of the Nazis and then leading into the Holocaust. It illustrates the power dynamic really well in the drawing by the Jews are all sort of represented as, as mice, sort of anthropologists promorphized to human mice and then and the nazis all showed as cats it's a really engaging sort of story about this family heavily based on art's father's own experience and it's pretty much a, a true story and it's just you kind of just get sort of sucked into this i don't know because it's like a story of, of sort of one man and his family so it gives it really like powerful focus you've got this character and you see kind of history unfolding around him and it, it's really engrossing it's quite an emotional story obviously it's it's incredibly sad because of the awful things that he goes through I'm about a quarter of the way through so based on my knowledge of history I know it's going to go to some darker places but it's a great it's a great story and it felt Really appropriate to be reading this warning from history right now. I was going to say, with this and Richard III, we'll be covering something Nazi-related in every episode now, just as a sort of apt, gentle commentary. It's like, what could we be talking about? What could the reference possibly be? Yeah, well, it's definitely, I think, people should be aware of things like this now, and definitely it's a time to read these uh, books that were written, you know, and sort of informed by people's past sort of experiences of these kind of hateful and divisive ideologies. And there was obviously a lot has been written and films made documenting what happened before, mainly uh, as a warning to future generations to never allow this to happen again. So if that's where we're heading, then it's important that we acknowledge these warnings from the past so that we don't repeat their terrible mistakes. Yeah, I know it's a very big respected comic. I actually haven't read it, which is disgraceful of me to be honest as a someone who's read a lot of comics i probably should have spent at some point in my life more time reading things like moors and less time reading you know endless batman it's really interesting it's it's really well drawn and it's just really well written and yeah 
if you um, were interested by some of the, I don't know, we talked about some World War II comics before, like like Uber, which is a very different story, but is also, again, partly well, about the Nazis and is sort of, again, like a warning from history. So if you've been interested in, in those things we discussed previously in the podcast, I would certainly recommend Mouse. Okay, first up this week, and our first comics adaptation of 2017. It's the Lego Batman movie. This is the sort of semi-sequel to the Lego movie that came out a couple of years back and was generally seen as a bit of a, a surprise smash hit. You know, not, not just, no, it's good, it's good for the joke, but a genuinely great film that actually transcended its sort of toy commercial limits and was quite affecting and incredibly good fun. So this is the Lego Batman character who was part of the ensemble in that film, voiced by Will Arnott, this time taking centre stage, running through lots of Batman jokes and Batman tropes, facing all his villains and... Well, we may try not to go too far to spoil all the surprises, but also some other people's villains. But yeah, it's just a sort of fun, affectionate romp through Batman history and Batman tropes. Alistair, what did you think? I, I really liked this film. It was very funny. That's like kind of my main thing. Uh, my main takeaway, I was sort of laughing pretty much continuously throughout the whole thing. The jokes were just spot on. There were definitely jokes that resonated with sort of the, the grown-ups in the audience. They have made sort of Batman into a, a comic character like a a comedic character i mean the whole premise of the whole thing obviously is slightly ridiculous it's just lego men running around and well and lego women running around doing lego things but they do great comments on sort of the tropes of batman and sort of heroes stories in general it's quite self-aware yeah and will arnett who voices batman does it really well and they've kind of they do a great job of sending up the kind of the ludicrous pomposity of batman yeah this is like the perfect antidote to batman versus superman that took batman like way too seriously and was like this is like really really dark deep stuff it's clearly what they were aiming at whereas this uh, this was silly batman but also kind of it, it wasn't silly in the way that like the adam west 60s batman was which was really silly this was kind of like poking fun at the kind of perception of batman as this sort of dark exploration of the tortured mortal soul or something like that really kind of poked fun at all all of that i don't know part of it wants to step up and defend the batman the deadly serious dark avenger just because i've enjoyed stuff that has actually taken that seriously over the years but i think it's kind of few and far between when you go to the this is a deadly serious dark story about the dark side of humanity you're kind of setting yourself up with quite high standards there i guess i mean as in i mean we've discussed this before it's like if you're once you go this is deadly serious this is dark there are no jokes there is no fun if your film isn't then completely brilliant or your comic isn't then completely brilliant then people will just sort of laugh at you so (laughs) yeah i mean obviously there's been great executions of dark Batman, you know, the kind of Christopher Nolan's, you know, Batman films, especially The Dark Knight. They've, yeah, obviously you can do that well. It's just kind of, because it's, those are different sort of interpretations of a character that they've been writing for about 80 years. The, you know, Dark Knight of the Soul sort of interpretation seems to be the the one that's really resonating with sort of people right now. And I think it's just important to point out some of the um, the other sort of dafter sides of Batman. It's kind of to rebalance it a bit. Yeah, but he contains multitudes, good old Batman. He, you know, he's been through so many different variations and interpretations and levels of darkness and silliness that you can sort of go from the Adam West stuff to the Christopher Nolan stuff to this sort of Lego Batman broad just jumping around bright colours children's toy parody thing and it's all sort of recognised to be the same character somehow it's kind of it's, it's almost impressive in a weird way yeah there's a consistency yeah the Lego Batman movie was yeah it is a lot of fun it's clearly undercutting Batman throughout him but you know he's clearly being ridiculous with all his darkness and seriousness and his sort of man cave attitude to the Bat Cave and his brooding constant sadness about his parents and yet it's also taking him seriously to the degree that you do feel sorry for him you do you know the later emotional beats about batman comes to realize that sometimes you just need to let people in or whatever you know I, as I say, i'll try not to spoil the ending because it doesn't seem to really be any point but funnily enough there's a positive emotional message in this children's film about Lego. i thought the plot was really really good and engaging kind of relates what to what you were just saying I'm, obviously i'm gonna dance around not saying how the film ends but the kind of plot line of the joker obviously batman's like main villain feeling that batman doesn't appreciate him and doesn't value their hero villain relationship i thought was just um I know, it's just really good sort of story and like you could kind of see where it was going and you know, again the story that as you saying batman doesn't want to let anyone in and then he meets dick grayson who becomes robin and he meets Commissioner Gordon's daughter, and he, obviously you know, these characters kind of get it become a part of his life. There's a there's a good like emotional story there, as well as the kind of 
there is a superhero plot line of the Joker has an evil scheme. Kind of like lots of the films from my childhood that I remember the most are the ones that, as well as having like an action plot line, had some kind of character emotional journey underneath it. And that's what, you know, some of the, the better films, like superhero films that come out now do, like I think Guardians of the Galaxy did that well with a kind of like an emotional story about a lost kid underneath the kind of sci-fi action story. You know, like Ant-Man had a quite nice little story about like about family underneath the kind of, again, the superhero heist story. So, and again, Lego Batman has this kind of story about people and how they relate to each other, kind of underpinning a big story about villains and heroes trying to, you know, fighting over a city. So but that was, that was well executed. So I'm hoping this does become a, a sort of film that children are seeing it now will kind of grow up as like, oh, that's like a good inspiring story from my childhood because it's got some complexity to it. Yeah, it's kind of funny, funny because this idea of Batman as the head of this sort of family of other crime fighting people. I mean, I mean, Alfred putting on a costume and fighting crime is more specific to this film, but in like the comics and you know, some of the cartoons and stuff over the last few years, partly maybe because of, you know, franchise needs. But, you know, Batman has become a, more sort of the head of this family of sidekicks rather than this sort of lone Avenger. It, it is a journey he's sort of tangibly gone through, which again is one reason why it perhaps resonated with my idea of Batman. I think also that's related to what we were saying about this, those are different types of Batman. I do know that in the Christopher Nolan ones Christopher Nolan committed very much to Batman you know works alone my interpretation of Batman is he doesn't have any sidekicks I think he categorically said we're not going to have Robin in my universe I guess Robin pops up right at the very very end of um sorry spoiler for a film that came out five years ago but um of the the Dark Knight Rises so like I say there's been Batman's been interpreted loads of different ways over the years I think it was the kind of shit storm that was Batman and Robin that kind of put people off having Batman as a character, you know, with sidekicks and, like you say, how like a family of heroes. I don't know. Robin, at some point, I think, became somewhat disgraced in the popular culture as this sort of the bus of these sort of his costume looks silly and also ooh, isn't it gay jokes? But he seems to be having a small comeback now, which is nice. I think it's, it's sort of fun having the kid around. Yeah, and I mean, in this film, to be fair, he's played in a sort of perhaps slightly affectionately mocking, annoying tag along orphan way, but it is quite funny, so I don't really care. Michael Cera is quite sort of enjoyably annoying. And yeah, the sort of the, the desperate Robin, the sort of fatherly Alfred, and the Batgirl as this sort of vaguely functional adult. It's a, it's a dynamic that works. It's not necessarily actually that identical to anything that's appeared in any other interpretation. You know, this is very much its its own little sub area of Batman interpretation. But you know, it's it's fun. It provides everything it needs. It's sort of this rather than trying to stick to this aesthetic of look, it's Gotham. It, there is an air of sort of anything could just pop out of nowhere, which obviously comes to the fore in the, the final third of the film, where it is just a massive fight. I think it also, it kind of fits into, I guess, the wider shared universe of Lego movies. And there are like, <laughs> refer- there are references to, um, yes, we're going there, we're going there. I mean, this is, oh, why? it's 2017, <laughs> everything is like shared movie. They mentioned the master building a few times, don't they? Yeah, yeah that's, yeah. that's what I was sort of going for. And they bring up characters from the Lego movie, while the other sort of DC characters get a cameo like Superman and Green Lantern. Much like the um, Lego movie, they're not adverse to pulling in other bits of the kind of Lego franchise at times, you know, when it's sort of necessary for a joke or for the plot. So you can kind of see, again, like another like sort of shared universe developing around these films. And in 2017, that seemed to be how films get made. I don't think it's necessarily tough you need to know about or care about to watch this film, though, because the callbacks and sort of other characters popping in, they are mostly just played as jokes. It's not like, I don't get the feeling that like the Lego Justice League appear to plug their future Lego Justice League movie. It is just, they're there because it's funny, you know, which is why it's less annoying than all those bits in the last two DC Cinematic Universe films, which did very much appear like Batman has just appeared to plug his film. The Flash has just appeared to plug his film, but they haven't even started filming yet. There's this, you know, the fact that the, the drop-ins and cameos are just played as fun and funny, and therefore, or, yeah, I don't really mind. The fact that it's ultimately funny throughout and always entertaining, and even when sort of, the use of random characters sort of dropping in, again, oh, I, I don't know if it's much point playing this spoiler game, but yeah, there's there's some cameos of other franchise characters, and yes, it's just fun, it's just like a, a bit, I don't know how well this would hold up as a moment if you're like re-watching it, but certainly the first time you see it, and when all these random characters, other stuff, just drop out of the sky, and you're just going, ha <laughs> look, it's them. And yeah, it's just good, it's just funny to watch the stakes just build and build and build, so therefore, yeah, sometimes... Even as a big comics fan, shared universe stuff can annoy me, but this film just promotes this sort of sense of childish glee that just makes it fun. Yeah, 
No, exactly. And I think what you said hit the nail on the head there. This film is filled with childish glee. It's, you know, it's just a great entertaining story. I just laughed a lot. You know, I, I thought the story was, I was engaged in the story. I was just laughing loads of the jokes. I thought, yeah, they, the execution is just sort of nailed perfectly. And I think it is kind of, it's, it works because it's built around the character of Batman, a character who like, you kind of get ingrained to you at an early age. There is a reason why this character has been chosen for this. I mean, well, partly because he was obviously a bit of a, a breakout star from the Lego movie. Also, you know, he's a character you can actually say enough about to support a film of this length, just riffing off, most, well, mostly just off this one character. Other stuff might struggle, but Batman, yes, there's, there's a lot of Batman material to mine for jokes. Yeah, lots of people know, sort of, yeah, know the character of Batman. I mean, we've had um, a gif sent in from Kirsty, which is of Lego Batman uh, in his limousine just saying... I don't talk about feelings. And actually, there is a good point here, which is that Batman is such an iconic character that he can be distilled down to a gif, and it kind of represents that character so, you know, in an understandable way. So, yeah, Batman is a very recognisable character, which is why I think it works so well to kind of you know, make jokes and play around with his sort of iconic status. And it's, really, and it's accessible to pretty much any cinema-going audience, even if you're a, a kid or a... A seasoned cynic like myself. I mean, even some other sort of bigger characters, like say Iron Man or something. I don't know if you could necessarily do a whole film riffing on, you know, jokes about the history and representations of Iron Man, because I don't think that many people know that many of them, except for the the Robert Downey Jr. film one. And there was a, a semi-successful cartoon in the nineties, I think. But that's about it. Yeah, I used to watch that cartoon. But yeah, Batman is just uniquely placed to make this work. Yeah, he's one of the most, I guess, iconic and best-known characters in the world probably right now, partly because of all the, yeah, all the films, games, and comics success. So, yeah, it, it plays with that really well. Like I say, like you say, I think it wouldn't really work with any many other characters. It wouldn't work as well. Yeah, part, part of me would have, would have liked more deeper dives into Batman mythology, like, you know, where were... Where about Azrael? Where's Batmite? Where's the Batman of Zoranar? But, you know, I think there's a... Although they did dive into some of the mythology, I think there's also an air of, you know, this needs to be pitched at the general public and kids and stuff. So therefore, I can't have my 20-minute Batman of Zoranar sequence because no one except me would understand it. They did do a good job of bringing in obscure and daft Batman characters, mainly the villains. Again, to par- partly to um, show the ridiculous side of Batman as a counterweight to the kind of dark and brooding side of Batman. Although they had some of his iconic villains, you know, like Penguin, Joker, Riddler, Bane. They also had some of the really, really daft ones over the years um, make cameos such as King Tut or the Condiment King. They really went for the jokes of like, come on guys, some of these villains are just really, really silly. Like, I can't imagine like a, a Christopher Nolan film in which Batman faces off against the Condiment King. They probably made fun of Killer Croc as well, which I always feel is doing a disservice to the, the long-running good name of the Croc family. But maybe, I've, maybe, maybe Killer Croc is just a, a bigger name to me than the rest of the world. He is just a big green lizard guy, basically. They did make quite a bit of fun of the Suicide Squad film as well. But yeah, no, this is this is very much what I want from a Lego Batman film. It it, it, it did the business well. I, if I had to criticise, and you know, as ever, I am on the internet, so I don't think it was quite as good as the Lego Movie, which is you know not really a mega criticism because the Lego Movie was properly transcendent and excellent. It really took its little premise and did something a lot bigger and better with it than I was really expecting it to. Whereas this, I think, just did its thing very well. Yeah, I would um, agree with you there. I think the Lego movie kind of was very, very funny throughout, then had a really kind of emotional moment right at the end, like a a real kind of touching moment where the joke stopped and it kind of became quite serious for a bit. And they nailed that moment perfectly. They kind of go for that in Lego Batman. It's not as successful. It's presence but it's it's like you say it's not it doesn't transcend in the way that the lego movie did the Le- lego batman resolves its characters and does its business there is quite a funny silly bit with involving lego figures yeah i won't i won't spoil that either but there is quite a, fun, a bit of fun silly lego business towards the end but it's but it doesn't you know properly build to a, its conclusion and explode the whole premise in quite the same sort of holy shit that's what it all means way i mean the first time you see the ending of the lego movie is quite an impressive <gasps> moment it's really really good this doesn't have anything that good in it which does mean i can't pretend this is as good as the lego movie but to be honest in all the sort of recent fun for all the family action films that i like there haven't been that many things that are as good as the lego movie so i can't really judge the lego batman movie ends with a big fight it is it is a well choreographed quite funny big fight it is just a long big fight that sort of concludes the emotional story in a way that's pretty obvious if you've been paying even the remotest attention it's so it's still satisfying in a sort of a warm nodding way but yeah as i say it's not it's not quite the lego movie is all i'm really saying yeah no i'd agree with you that it's doesn't quite 
hit that level. But the film is does have a good emotional core to it and a lot of great jokes and some good set pieces. So it's likely to be um, one of the best superhero movies of this year. I mean, it's the first one, but I think it sets quite a high bar. We'll see um, what manages to surpass it throughout the year. But I would highly recommend everyone to go see it. It is just really entertaining and really fun. I think I've seen people say this is the best Batman film ever. I don't necessarily agree with that, but it is the best cinema Batman certainly since Christopher Nolan stopped making them and possibly since a bit before that because to be honest this might be best than The Dark Knight Rises just possibly but yeah it's definitely the best cinema Batman for a while Next we will be discussing T2 Train Spotting, the sequel to 1996's Train Spotting. It's 20 years later and Renton played by Ewan McGregor is back in Edinburgh to reconnect with his old heroin buddies after having a midlife crisis. However, the fact that he stole 16 grand from them casts a long shadow over their friendship. Things are made more complicated by Begbie, as that's Robert Carlyle, escaping from prison and seeking revenge. Nick watched the original Train Spotting for the first time recently, so how did this compare to the original? Um, well, it's certainly different. The original, yeah, I haven't seen the original because, whatever, I'm behind on a lot of classic films. So I watched the original because I got the feeling that this is one of those sequels, follow-ups, where having not seen the original would just make it a sort of slightly meaningless experience for me. So, whereas I went into last year's Ghostbusters, having not seen any of the original Ghostbusters, I did watch Trainspotting before seeing T2 Trainspotting, which is a weird title, by the way. And yeah, Trainspotting was great. It was a very focused, intense film about these characters going through their lives in a very sort of... It was quite a meandering plot in its way, but somehow it also felt really intense and really strangely meaningful in a way that maybe life does when you're on heroin, I don't know. I've never tried it. But T2, yeah, it felt like one of those sort of five years later epilogues you sometimes get at the end of films, only longer and a whole separate film. It's a lot better made than a lot of these sort of nostalgia sequels, you know, in the fact they're all quite good actors, especially Robert Carlyle, who is just relentlessly entertaining as Begbie, even in the, the sequel. And... I enjoy Ewan McGregor. Johnny, it was weird seeing Johnny Lee Miller back in this part after watching a whole season of him as Sherlock in Elementary. You kind of always forget it's the same guy until you realise that all he's had to do is bleach his hair or make his hair that colour and then suddenly he's sick boy again. It justifies itself in quite a lot of clever ways by making the nostalgia and the fact that it's ultimately a nostalgic sequel kind of part of the film. Like a lot of this is about these guys and how they relate to that time in their youth and how it's sort of thinking about that sort of defines them as they are now. And how they can't seem to get away from sort of the shadow of it or the the weird desire to return to it, even though it was in some way awful. So, yeah, the fact that it's actually clearly aware of what it's doing, the fact that it is, you know, stylishly made and well acted, does make it, I think, a better than average nostalgia sequel. But on the other hand, I don't think it ever fully got away from the fact that it's a slightly masturbatory nostalgia sequel, is, I think, where I am with this. Yeah, I think it's kind of covering the main points. I really enjoy it as a film, what made me like it is mainly the performances, especially Ewan McGregor and Robert Carlyle and Johnny Lee Miller and um, Ewan Brenham as well, the fourth member of the original cast to return. I thought they, they, they really nailed their characters very well. It's quite a long film, but it's paced well and you know, so you never feel bored or that. So sort of taking its time. You really are engaged with these characters and also the story that they're telling. I mean, at no point did I feel it, it dragged. I was right there with them. I wanted to see where it went. It's quite a, well, like the original train spotting, it's got twists and turns and sort of various different like aspects sort of come together at the end. Direction was also very good. Yeah, Danny Boyle's a great director and he did a really good job in, you know, giving this real sort of stylish edge. You know, he was. Yeah, really kind of showing off almost as a director, but it didn't feel like it was indulgent or over the top. It suited the sort of aesthetic they were going for, a kind of a flashy film, which I thought was really good. There was great use of music. Yeah, there's lots of music throughout, just like the original, but some, you know, some places they used music that had appeared in the original film or sort of remixed versions of the music for the original film as you say because it is quite this is quite a nostalgic film but they also introduced a lot of new songs you know music from this contemporary as well as music that's from the 90s yeah i don't regret seeing this i don't think i just came away thinking a bit sort of eh, did that matter did that have much much to say beyond here's what happens to these characters if you're interested you know if you fancy it if you want to return to that world for a bit and see what's going on but yeah a lot of there's a lot of individual stylish shots or stylish sequences which made it you know it meant it didn't drag meant the film as a whole had a bit of momentum like the whole robbery sequence where they where sick boy and Renton decide they need some money for their new business venture so decide to rip off this weird cult of 
historical reenactors or something. It's they're orange men. Is um, so really, really aggressively Protestant Scots. <laughs> yeah, they just they they ripped them off in this funny and also quite clever little heist sequence, which as an individual bit within the film was great. That was possibly the most entertaining 20, 25 minutes of the whole film. Yeah, there was a lot of sort of nice shots of Edinburgh. There was it's, it's weird that this sort of quite nostalgia for the old days film is also the first film I've seen use like Snapchat filters and face swaps on screen. <laughs> that that made me laugh for some reason. I guess they're trying to update it to be presence they don't want to make it just all about the nostalgia from the 90s i don't don't think it's that defensive i think there has to be an element to it It has to they have to make making the point that this is about these guys who are this group dynamic that's of the past sort of wedging itself into the present yeah there's definitely a point to it i think which is again the fact why this film often works quite well scene by scene even if you come away thinking as a whole was that quite empty because i think it has thought about what it's doing better than a lot of sort of these sort of sequels do i mean there are a lot of bits where it sort of brings back songs or shots from the old film which is you know the sort of thing you usually do in this and sometimes they work and sometimes they think oh come on do something else but you know for the most part it's it's thought about it enough for it not to feel too stupid perhaps and again perhaps predictably there's a a 2017 update of the choose life speech which sort of starts off feeling quite rote and as he builds through it does actually start to become quite powerful and sad that bit was also really good yeah i mean the original train spotting said something about you know 1996 when it was so you know set and this one they uh, clearly they wanted to say something about 2016 i guess when it was made rather than you know it'd be entirely a commentary on the past which is why there they've updated it in ways like they use the kind of the new edinburgh landscape now that sort of some it's been gentrified a bit is appears a lot in the film um like i say they have snapchat filters they update the choose life monologue as well as using sometimes even like footage from the original like they visit the corner where the first film opens and again they edit in the original footage and so yeah in some ways yeah it is a very nostalgic film as well as being a very contemporary film but I think what it does it really embraces nostalgia I mean we are a culture that's kind of addicted to nostalgia which is why you know again bringing back train spotting is something that we decided to put money towards of the same you know for the same reason that we like to see like sort of batman over and over or there's been remakes of dad's army and things like that we are a culture that values nostalgia quite highly and train spotting is aware this is the reason why it's coming back so the characters are quite nostalgic for again their lost past it sort of embraces nostalgia by like, you know, there's a scene where they, the Johnny Lee Miller and Hugh McGregor character go to like a, a cheese night and all the teenagers are like singing along to Queen and dancing to run DMC. And they kind of look a bit perplexed because it's almost an element of like, when we were young, we listened to music that came out, you know, now. Why is everyone who's young now listening to music that's older than the music we were into? Because, you know, nostalgia has become a you know, real cultural currency. So Trainspotting T2 plays around with this idea i think it does is quite an effective commentary which me- makes it more than just a nostalgia film itself there's even a slightly odd bit when they seem to do heroin again purely for pretty much nostalgic reasons and they play again the born slippy over the top although slightly uh remixed that was a, a bit, again a weird sequence if only because it felt like they were doing heroin just because they were in a train spotting film it didn't seem to have much impact on what was before or after except i guess because it was them perhaps the inevitable consequence of them getting heavily into the nostalgia for that time but then again it also felt more like there should be some sort of consequence to it maybe i don't know yeah but as i say i just i'd watched the original train spotting about i can't remember about three or four days before we saw this and that did successfully imbue me with the idea that there should be more consequence i don't know more sort of genuinely meaningful sadness i mean there's a there's obviously there's lots of bits in train spotting some of which i'll now spoil because that's films like 20 years old where someone's baby just dies in its crib because they were all too strung out to actually you know notice that it might want feeding or anything or to notice that it wasn't breathing and it's really really you know heart-stopping moments it's not and again one of the main characters dies in train spotting one this film is i don't know although it is yeah it is a nicely made film and it is saying something about the nostalgia of these middle-aged guys for their perhaps ultimately not that good but still at least it was exciting youth yeah i don't know if this film really felt quite as vital and intense as train spotting wanted yeah i think you're right there there's definitely a difference in terms of tone and plot here i mean the original was really kind of sold as a sort of gritty 
realist drama. They're like, this is what it's like, you know, on council estates in Edinburgh, you know, when heroin is kind of the only real sort of lifestyle choice because of the sort of the crushing poverty. Even in the more fantastical bits, like when Hugh McGregor has to climb down a toilet to get his suppository back, it's more about showing how unglamorous and depressing this sort of life on heroin is. Whereas, you know, this film is a different film. This is more of a film uh, that's about friendship and sort of nostalgia and midlife crisis. And it's also kind of, it's got elements of being a crime film, a bit more of a thriller than, a, say, a, a gritty realist film. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, I'm probably sounding like I'm more down on this film than I, you know, actually am, I guess. I mean, indeed, as someone who is not as old as the, the train spotting guys, but, you know, uh, who is definitely not at the younger end of the young person scale anymore, as, as I'm cruising into my mid-30s, I can get a lot of empathy with some of the parts where you do sort of look back at your younger days and think that was awful, but also I kind of missed the excitement and I'm conflicted about this. But I haven't. It hasn't blossomed into a full midlife crisis. So I'm sure that's still to come. That, that's, that's next year. Look, look out for our midlife special coming up next year on Border Fantasy Violence, in which we discuss uh, how sad we feel about our wasted youths. So yeah, I mean, that's maybe that's one reason why, even though I'm not sure the film needed to exist, a lot of the emotional bits did work for me because it did feel sincere. It did feel like a an accurate reflection of sad aging men looking back at their youth and feeling weird about it. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of what the kind of the emotional core of the film is. Um, and obviously it's got brilliant like kind of performances and really interesting directorial set pieces on top of it. But that's kind of, you know, what's sort of underneath. I felt also this was very much a film about going full circle. I mean, it, it begins with Hugh McGregor like arriving in Edinburgh, whereas obviously the first one ends with him leaving Edinburgh. And you know, this is a film that plays out the credits to um, Iggy Pop's Lust for Life, which is what the first one opens with well yeah i think that's that's clearly a very intentional decision yeah exactly and it it, whereas the first film begins with these characters together and blows them apart the second film begins with them apart and brings them together you know that kind of again it's kind of completing the circle which feels depressing in a way because at the end of train spotting one it was at least to my mind made to seem uplifting and positive that mark venton the, the ewan mcgregor character had actually escaped this sort of life in Edinburgh on heroin and well he doesn't entirely lapse all the way back into that seeing it, that ending undone to at least some extent kind of felt a bit like defeat for me which is always the problem with these sequels which they've sort of tried to skip around but you always fall back into the fact that you know when you do a f- sequel to a film that was basically a complete story in order to get the characters back together and get a similar vibe you need to kind of undo the complete ending of the first film yeah wait, wait, I mean you know I mean, ultimately you, you could just go on with your life and pretend this film doesn't exist if you want but it does always feel like a bit of a, a sad climb down yeah it is interesting, yeah, that there was a sense of progression with the first film, which they have sort of undone a bit with this one. Yeah, but they've, and in order to do that, in order to justify it and make it seem not depressing, they've kind of made the Venton character less sympathetic. I mean, it's sort of, I think it's seen as him taking a bit of a personal defeat, and due to a degree of weakness, you know, it's, yeah, because he isn't strong enough or good enough or willful enough to just keep living outside this little weird codependent group. They do paint him as quite an unsympathetic character. I guess he did. He stole from his friends, but then I guess his friends aren't particularly sympathetic anyway. I guess Begby is presented as the least sympathetic of all characters. You don't feel particularly bad that that uh, you know you McGregor stole money from him, and he did give some money to to Spud the sort of fourth member of the group, although obviously giving lots of money to a heroin addict is a... Um... Yeah, another, another positive seeming ending bit for the first film that has to be made negative in order for the second film to exist. Yeah. Although there was an element of realism in that, which is when Spud... Is it, made, very... it makes sense, yeah. Yeah. Spud's really angry at Hugh McGregor, and then Hugh McGregor's character, Renton, is saying, I, I gave you, you know, four grand, and spud's like i'm a heroin addict what do you expect me to do with four grand and realize that yeah that's not, that was a that was a stupid idea i i mean i came out the first film thinking thinking okay i'm roughly on renton's side renton is a broadly sympathetic character i came out the second film thinking okay taking that into account maybe renton's a bit of a self-absorbed dick and an idiot i don't know whether that means i was just wrong the first time or if they've re-evaluated the older renton a bit i guess well he's changed in that 20 years have come by and personalities well, changed yeah. so i mean there's all the characters have changed to a degree like the johnny lee miller character he's become much more of a like a criminal you know now he's like all his sort of interests and activities are sort of crime based so become part of that world whereas before he was just a skaghead he wasn't trying to create like a criminal enterprise spud's the character that's kind of changed the least 
he's still kind of you know living in the same estates he grew up in, still taking heroin, still sort of struggling with his life. Because he's the one who sort of had some progression in that he didn't really progress much in the first film. And in this film, they gave his character a some progression that didn't get undone or undo what happened before. They actually managed to resolve his character a bit by fi- him finding a way to fight his demons. So in that, he had one of the best character journeys that involved like taking a sort of a step forward Spud was good in this film I mean if, if anything to for, to make up for Venter no longer being the sympathetic one who escapes they actually introduced another character to have that role which was quite fun but yeah no it was it's a, it's a decent film I think if you're in the market for a train spotting sequel they've done a, they've done a pretty good job this is considering the train spotting was a, a fairly self-contained film but didn't really point to needing a sequel they've had a decent go at it I'm still not sure it really needed a sequel but if you fancy it it is what it is when I first heard about this film I had low expectations and I thought, oh God, like this is the the final indictment of you know, how uncreative cinema has become in the fact we're doing sequel to train spotting, a film that like tells a story and really conclusively wraps it up. And I went into that film with sort of that in mind, thinking this probably isn't gonna be very good. And I came out being really impressed. They convinced me, yes, there is definitely more story to tell, there's more to hear from these characters. And I really enjoyed the sort of the flair and the uh, intensity with which it was directed. So I went in with low expectations and I came out genuinely impressed. Okay, next up we'll be talking about Legion, the new tangentially X-Men related TV show focusing on David Haller, a young man who's dealing with the troubling combination of mental illness and incredibly powerful mutant superpowers. Yep, this is a new series executive produced by Noah Hawley, who's best known for the Fargo TV show, which I haven't seen, which takes a slightly surreal approach to how David Haller's problems interface with his various other problems and shows us what's going on through a range of nested flashbacks and hallucinations. It stars Dan Stevens as David and also features Aubrey Plaza of Parks and Rec fame as Lenny and a few other characters as well. It's based very loosely on a range of Legion stories from throughout his time in the comics. He's a sort of background X-Men character who's had one ongoing series written by Cy Spurrier, who wrote Cry Havoc, which we talked about a while back, which was excellent, actually. If you've got access to Marvel Unlimited, then I would actually recommend digging out the X-Men Legacy series by Cy Spurrier about the Legion character. But for those who haven't read the comic, I think this is a pretty fun, self-contained story. Alistair, what did you think of the first episode? Yeah, it was interesting. It certainly grabs your attention. It's not quite a conventional sort of TV science fiction thriller. It's There's lots of sort of flourishes in the, in the directing. It's one of those things that doesn't portray the, the story it's trying to tell in a sort of straightforward, accessible way. I mean, the main character is someone who's suffering from mental health problems. He also has sort of X-Men abilities that he's not aware of. And he, I think, kind of attributes the strange things that happen around him because of his abilities to mental health problems. Like, it's sort of implied that he's telepathic, can read other people's thoughts. But then he just thinks they're voices in his head, where actually they are other people's thoughts. It also doesn't help that whenever his sort of powers manifest, he's usually alone. Like, he has telekinetic abilities, but they sort of manifest himself when he becomes emotional or enraged. And he usually like will then trash a room, but he's usually by himself or involuntary trash a room using his telekinetic powers. And someone will see what's happened, the aftermath, and then think, oh, he's just, you know, had a breakdown. The show plays around with how much of what's going on, all the strangeness is the fact that he has superpowers and how much is his mental health problems. You're not quite certain where one stops and the other begins, uh, which is an interesting way of putting it across the plot is told in a non-linear way there are definitely things where it will show you something and then something else will it'll show you actually what you're seeing something else you've got an unreliable narrator going on it's it is quite complex and at times slightly confusing plot but it is also really engaging and interesting so i enjoyed the first episode yeah i think the first episode, although it did tell its story in quite a non-linear way, I think by the end I had a, I at least understood where it was coming from in terms of what David perceived as having happened in what order. So it's, although it is obviously almost always open to the revelation that some or all of it was actually a figment of his imagination, which is sort of vaguely hinted at the end. It's all a bit wafty, but yeah, the general vibe of sort of uncertainty and paranoia and which parts of his superpowers and, and just the idea of superpowers as this sort of godlike thing that 
affects your world in strange ways you don't really understand, I think is a fun thing to get back to after watching a lot of superhero movies where people just wave and people fall over and it's not really seen as it just becomes a bit of a sort of standard visual whereas things like this where people get genuinely hurt or these things happen and people are obviously really affected or that quite scary bit where he where all the doors in his asylum just get filled with walls and yeah it feels very weighty it feels very like they've actually considered superpowers in a way that i think some people writing shows about people with massive superpowers perhaps don't consider in the same way because we've just become so used to just seeing them zapping around and the added mental health aspect which gives him this sort of weird relationship with it just makes it that little bit more scary and more weird so yeah it's a really good show i think if it keeps up at this level and doesn't disappear up his own arsehole or become incomprehensible or or go the other way and become kind of standard and boring yeah it could be among the best of the current sort of comics tv generation or the sort of superhero tv anyway it's definitely doing some interesting things i liked it quite a lot yeah it was a strong opening um it'd be interesting to see if they can sustain this level of securitous plotting and outlandish visuals and confused main character because it's it's a very sort of like powerful opening with that Obviously, as the plot progresses and the characters develop, the main character is going to become more aware of what's going on and, I guess, more aware of himself. And I guess that might lead to a sort of falling away of the sort of interesting and unusual flourishes that this first episode had, which kind of is what made it so engaging. But they've got some really good characters. They've built a kind of a core group of characters and they've got a good few plot lines going on so um, I'm certainly interested to see where it goes and yeah I really hope they do keep making it interesting and unusual in this way um, we've seen a lot of good shows recently that have been have you know these interesting sort of artistic flourishes on top of the story they're trying to tell there's Breaking Bad it was shot in a quite unusual way and had lots of interesting visual motifs as well as trying to tell the sort of gritty story yeah it reminded me of a lot of the stuff I've seen from Brian Fuller the guy who made Dead Like Me and Hannibal and Pushing Daisies and Wonderfuls the other various other sort of things it was a bit less perhaps brightly colorful be so quirky than some of the Brian Fuller stuff but it did sort of play with time and space and perception and yeah there was a lot, a lot, a lot of sort of nice sort of experimental bits that I quite enjoyed and flourishes and it managed to portray mental health in a way that wasn't too annoying which was nice to see I quite enjoyed the love interest character Sydney yeah they, they introduced her and then sort of got into the plot quite quickly which could feel quite shallow if it had been done badly but I think they just about got the right level of not faffing around and actually you know giving her some depth and a few good character moments to you know hook you into the character like you do they do in a good movie you know you have to just establish the character by giving her a few moments of like clear characterization where you get what they're like and then you just go from there and i think they did a good job of bringing us into all the characters like that quite quickly and then just getting on with the plot rather than giving us scene after scene of introduction i mean that is one of the things that made it quite a push them in the deep end and see if they sink or swim type show it didn't really faff around giving you lengthy here's what this person is like here it is again do you get it do you get it it just sort of gave you a very quick intro and then just pushed forward, which I do appreciate. It's one of the things that makes it feel like, you know, a good bit of, air quotes, premium telly rather than something sort of slower and more expository. That's good that it did that, that it kind of introduced the characters and moved on to telling the story. And there's a lot, to, like a lot of first episodes, it's got the burdens that a first episode always has. It needs to introduce plot, setting, character and kind of hook you into the you know that you want to stick with it and obviously first episodes have a lot of heavy lifting to do which means sometimes they can be weaker because they, they've got so much to do that it's hard to do it all really well but actually i think this is one of this is a really really good opening to a tv show i didn't feel it even though it had you know the same work to do as any first episode of a new show you know introducing plot and characters and situation but it did it really deftly it was good i didn't feel like i was just having exposition dumped on me um i was engaged with the story they were trying to tell straight away and i felt from the beginning i'm in a story i'm not this is not something that's setting up a story that's going to start later on this is we're in a story now so yeah i thought it was a definitely a strong opening um when it's I mean, it's hard to get a really really good engaging first episode but they did that i think it was a good decision there to actually give even though they had a lot of weirdness and is this what's really happening stuff going on there was also a good decision there to actually end the episode with a clear ending which just about explains all the stuff that came before it as well as giving you a bit more to set up later episodes so you do feel you've had a complete unit as well as some teasing for the future and also a good decision i think not to tease too many annoying x-men connections i mean as someone who's watched four episodes no sadly not four episodes it's four whole seasons well three three seasons at the start of the fourth season of agents of shield which does get a bit prone to trying to keep us interested by mentioning the hulk or reminding us that it's connected to iron man it's just yeah it's 
it used the X-Men stuff in a, a nice way to sort of just bring in, you know, the fact that this is a mutant universe and that's how they have their superpowers, but it didn't really, it didn't feel the need to name check Wolverine or anything, which is good, I think. Yes, I agree with you. That was great. And this is clearly a story set in the X-Men universe, but they weren't like, yeah, name checking X-Men things all the time. They were sort of quietly confident that we're, we're telling this story about these characters. We want people to be engaged with them and their story. We don't want people to be watching with the um, expectation that Professor X or Wolverine are going to turn up at some point, And that's really why we're here. And it doesn't feel that like it felt the need to sell into other products, you know, or other films. It just even though it's clearly set in those universes and it appeals to the, their fans, there was an element of you could approach this if you just got an interest in science fiction, even if you were the one person in the world who didn't know anything about X-Men and never heard of them. You could just sit down and watch this and like, this is a science fiction show about these characters telling this story. It's set in a world with, you know, superpowers and stuff, but you don't need to know about the broader meta plot of the X-Men universe. You can just be like, I just want to find out about these characters and their story. Yeah, I quite liked in the ending where, I'm not actually going to, to spoil the actual plot, but there's a bit at the end where the lead character is running through a sort of military conflict between what looks like sort of mutants and mutant hunting angry soldiers. And that bit was a bit more traditional X-Men. And I quite it was quite weird seeing that again after the way Legion has sort of downplayed the mutant power stuff and made it all quite subtle and quite scary and sudden when it happens and then suddenly you've got people just running around and zapping each other and throwing each other around across the room with their telekinetic powers and it was quite weird again i think in a, a sort of good way good sort of keeping you off balance way that legion clearly wants to do to see that contrasted with the way it had all superpowers in the rest of the show i don't know what the the balance is going to be going forward whether by the end of the season we're going to see you know whole episodes which just legion fighting baddies by pointing at them as i as i think i've already said i kind of hope not but we'll see yeah i agree with you there i hope they stick with this tone of it being about as much about the character's in a personal conflict, him dealing with his mental health problems and also keeping it about the interpersonal conflict, his relationship with the other characters introduced in the first episode, specifically his family and his um, love interest. I hope it remains as much a show about those things as it does become about a broad kind of science fiction criminal, you know, the fact that they're being hunted, um, they're sort of outlaws. Um, you know, there's a kind of the wider politics, of the X-Men universe. Although those that's interesting and you can tell good stories with those backdrops. I do want this to remain focused on this main character, his relationships with the other main characters and his sort of internal conflict. I do want that to kind of be the primary. That's what I'm invested in here. Not so much the wider X-Men stuff. And I do want them to stick with that. But yeah, no, it was a good start. The, the guy playing David, Dan Stevens, was good. It's always nice to see Aubrey Plaza in stuff. I just finished watching the whole of Parks and Rec, so seeing her back in a good show is always nice. Yeah, I thought yeah, very well cast. Everyone acted really well. I mean, I I might it may well have been the case anyway, but you know, I think this is only an eight episode season, which is nice. Hopefully, that means they'll be able to tell quite a focused story. I think I'm definitely gonna stick with it. Yep, yeah, me too. I'm certainly gonna keep watching because um, I'm really interested to find out where they take these characters. It's certainly a great opening that hooks you in. So I've got my interest. Let's see. Uh, let's see what they do with it. All right. Last episode, I recommended that Nick watch Danish horror show Kingdom, created by Lars von Trier and shot roughly according to the Dogme 95 rules, Kingdom tells the strange, creepy and at times terrifying story of events in a haunted Danish hospital. So Nick's had a chance to watch the eight episodes of Kingdom that are currently extant in the world. What did you think? Yes, yes, that was really good. I, wait, when you recommended it, you did say, oh, you, you, you only need to watch like the first few episodes, like, I don't know, one or two or three. And then I just got I got going on it and I was like, no, this is really good. I'm going to watch all eight because I'd like to have seen it. And, you know, if I put it off, I'll probably never finish it. So, yeah, I watched the whole thing. And yes, this was good. This is among my favourite of the recommendations yet. Yeah, it, it was an enjoyable companion piece to my recent sort of watching Twin Peaks for the first time. It was this sort of mundane start growing into this increasingly bizarre surrealism, which everyone seems weirdly OK with, even if it grows more bizarre. And then this sort of eventual bringing in of the genuine creepy evil. I mean, as you said, there are eight episodes ex- in the world annoyingly it looks like they're never going to finish the story the the eighth episode 
although it is not a finale, it has a sort of, I suppose, what could be a really bleak ending. But really, it's not. It's a cliffhanger. And, yeah, it looks like he's never going to finish it because a couple of, at least a couple of the main actors involved have passed away. So it is what it is. But it's one of these things that even though the story isn't finished, it has so much style and it's so just ridiculously enjoyable that I'd, I'd actually recommend watching it anyway. It's just quite good. The sort of the hazy brown vibe, the sense of it's just like that, the sort of the increasingly weird dark comedy of... Like, the, there's a bit where one character who is secretly a demon is just walking along and then he just grows horns out of his forehead suddenly and then realises everyone's looking at him, so just sort of grabs them, snaps them off his forehead and then legs it. It's just... <laughs> and then everyone just goes back about their day. And it's just quite funny. Yeah, it's it can be quite funny as well as incredibly creepy. I mean, there's, there's a lot of storylines that run across the the eight episodes there are some that are quite short and get resolved quickly there's some longer ones some of them can be like creepy and funny like there's the in the first series there's the the people who have the dead head in a fridge yeah and that's sort of even though it's quite creepy it's also kind of a bit silly but there's also some really quite unsettling plot lines there's the unusual pregnancy plot line kind of giving birth to this sort of uh horrible deformed creature in a very sort of eraser head style plot twist um, that's probably one of the sort of creepiest and most visceral of the the plots. But there's also like a running plot line about them being in- inspected by the director general and the minister and how it, pretty much everything goes wrong on the minister's visit. That is actually quite funny. Yeah, and the, and the senior guy is having this sort of increasingly silly breakdown and the one of the characters appears to be a zombie or something approaching a zombie due to being poisoned or something it's quite weird and again everyone's just sort of going with it for the most part it's like oh he started lumbering around muttering about how we need to exterminate everyone he must be having a bad day or something (laughs) yeah it's kind of bizarre how everyone just sort of accepts the weird things that go in this hospital and doesn't really question them like the there's a ghost ambulance there's sort of spirits appearing in the halls there's there's like a ghost dog at one point there's sort of strange and occult rituals i mean the the broad kind of underlying plot or sort of theme of the show is that this was kind of an ancient vaguely spiritual site that now has been a center of learning and reason has been built on top of and the idea that old superstitions are are like breaking through the wall of kind of science and reason but that's only really mentioned in like the intro sequence and it yeah that that concept barely ever comes really comes up in the but there's show. a few bits like the the doctors of the hospital have sort of formed into a masonic lodge and there's various people talking at points about they must fight against the occult and fight against sort of unreason using science and reason and there's there's various plot lines and there's um, one of the main plot lines is uh, a woman who's a medium and she's sort of trying to hold seances and talk to kind of spirits in the building and sort of investing some of the other patients with kind of hope that there's life after death and some of the doctors want to discourage this as much as possible because they see it as against reason and against the cold hard logic of medicine so there are there are tensions there but it's they kind of get swept away in some of the weirder plot lines. I mean, the show as a whole starts as a sort of, in its own way, but a lot of it's quite a sort of serious medical drama for about two episodes. Or maybe serious is the wrong word, but quite a grounded, non-magical, non-occult medical drama where people are just going around this hospital having their sort of medical plots. There's quite a lot, and it's, it's still good. There's still quite a lot of, like, fun dialogue and silly interplay. And there's the, as you say, the ridiculous bit where this bloke has this severed head and he's just hiding it everywhere. And the sort of the weird magic stuff only starts to really break through around the third or fourth episode, which is one reason why I, I thought wanted to watch a bit more because I didn't feel like I'd really gotten to the meat, the meat of it quite yet. Yeah, it is quite a slow intro. Yeah, but but yeah, it's, it's good. I mean, again, that reminds me a bit of Twin Peaks. If they're always sort of, they just know that the magic occult stuff is there. It's like it's something that's just lurking out in the woods and occasionally breaks through. And it just seems to be how these people live in the kingdom. Even though no one, very few people except a few in this sort of Masonic Lodge actually say there is magic and the occult out there. It just seems to be kind of there. It, it's weird. It's never really explained. And it's just one of these shows that's handles that quite nicely and entertainingly rather than it being kind of half a loaf and annoying yeah so yeah it's good yeah yeah i also enjoyed the um bantery relationship between the lead medium woman and her son yeah her long-suffering son continually kneeling each other and also actually lars von trier himself appearing over the credits of each episode to sort of talk it down in this sort of mock up beat way his sort of yeah uh, like something really strange and weird will happen particularly uh, at the end of like some of the later episodes and lars von trier will come on and go this all seems quite concerning doesn't it I, I, I hope you have a pleasant evening if you choose to return. It was always all a bit lemony snicket, really. Should you want to return to this misery? Yeah, it's a, cause each episode kind of ends with the theme, which begins with this sort of bizarre sort of sped up shrieking noise. And then 
that's kind of what the twist of the end of each episode kind of plays out to. And then, like, uh, like almost like a curtain comes down, like it's the end of a theatre production. And then Lars von Trier steps out wearing a tuxedo just to say some kind of vaguely pleasant things and and vaguely unsettling things about the episode. It's just another one of those, wait, is, is that real? Am I imagining this? There's a lot of moments in, in this show of basically kind of like, wait, did that just happen? Because it's really kind of hits, it just hits you from sort of left field or something that's just odd. And then kind of acts like, this is perfectly normal. That's another one of this sort of this idea of sort of these weird, slightly magic seeming external characters commenting on the action. Like there's a couple of characters who are working as dishwashers in, I assume, in the hospital. Who they get usually they usually cut back to them about I don't know four or five times an episode, and they have a sort of a conversation which, in either direct or vague terms, is about the rest of the plot in a slightly creepy way. I mean, they're never explained. No one else ever interacts with them. Maybe it would they would have done if they'd there'd been another series. But yeah, it's just sort of this creepy magical commentary and the Lars von Trier stuff feels similar to that as well. Yeah, you're right. There's, there is the kind of the odd thing about the two people just doing the dishes who have knowledge of everything but never seem to interact with any of the other characters. Yeah, that's like just another kind of element of its strangeness. You know, as well as it's got like dead people in formaldehyde jars and a guy who wants to have um, sort of the world's largest liver tumour transplanted into him so that it can become the property of science. That's quite a gross plot line. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if I had to put my tedious critic hat on, I'm not sure the second season entirely kept up the momentum, especially at the beginning. The first couple of episodes of the second season felt like the tension had gone slack a bit, but then it built back up again, so it was fine. It's, it's, it is really a very good Yeah, show. and there's like there are a few kind of more sort of down-to-earth dramatic elements of it, which are the main character is a Swedish doctor who's had to move to Denmark because he's disgraced and he's, you know, he's under investigation for performing an operation that lobotomized this child. You know, and there's kind of like a medical drama element to it. And then sort of out of this, the kind of more surreal plot lines evolve. Well, most of the the plot lines sort of start off in a sort of hospital soap area. Like the first couple of episodes, as I said, because they're quite sort of hospital soapy, and they all take on slightly more twisted elements and move more in that direction as the show goes along. Yeah. It reminds me a bit of Green Wing in a weird way. I mean, obviously, Green Wing's a bit more of a surreal comedy and less of a sort of. There's a, this has more of a vibe of actual creepy horror, but still, it, it, it was hard not to occasionally think about it. The other thing that makes this show really good is the way that it's shot. I mean, everything's sort of sepia toned and quite dark. And it's all shot with like handheld cameras. It's quite grainy. But even though it's kind of, it can be quite a difficult to watch in that it's quite dark in that like literally there's not much light and the footage is quite grainy. It kind of, I think, makes it seem more realistic, even though it's a very sort of fantasy horror show. The fact that it kind of looks like you're, you're watching kind of handheld footage, handheld kind of grainy footage makes it seem more realistic. It's kind of like the way the thick of it is all kind of shot like it's a documentary, even though you never see the documentary crew will really find out what's going on from the documentary point of view, but, you know, makes it seem more realistic. Whereas in Kingdom, yeah, it, the fact that it's kind of, again, shot in this sort of documentary way makes the kind of the creepiness and the strangeness seem more, like, believable. I, I started this uh, segment by saying there's a sort of rough adherence to the Dogme 95 filmmaking rules, which was a sort of filmmaking movement started by Lars von Trier and several other people that basically has a sort of a strict adherence to realism and reality. So some of the rules of Dogme are like only using natural light, using handheld cameras. You can't bring props to scenes. You have to find locations where those props would exist. It follows the Dogme 95 conventions in that way, in that it's shot, yeah, with natural light and handheld cameras and you know and set in locations where the, the action takes place. It's not on sets or it's not artificial in that way. But so that kind of makes it seem very realistic, even though it's this sort of fantastical story they're telling however the other aspects of dogme 95 are things like you can't show things that aren't actually happening so in a true adherence to dogme 95 you can't have a murder unless the actor is literally killed some of them they've got very high certificate some of these films because you can't have a sex scene unless the actors are literally having sex so you can't obviously create a, a supernatural horror dogme film because you'd have to show real ghosts and real murders so it's kind of playing with that ultra realistic convention by making the one thing that really you can't make in that convention at all yeah i think that the horror stuff is made more weird and horrible and slightly creepier by the fact that it's, it's largely off screen i mean there's a couple of bits like the bit i mentioned earlier with the the horns and a few others where like horrible stuff really appears but aside from that a lot of it yeah a lot of it is 
just out the corner of your eye or achieved via like effects on the camera rather than actually showing look it's a monster I mean there is one obvious big exception to this but yeah that's... yeah it's it, it's a look it's a very distinctive show to look at which I think does help give it this sense of sort of style and aesthetic that I think makes it good and worth watching yeah so if you're a fan of uh, horror certainly check this out because it can be very very creepy at times and yeah it's got a sort of cult status I think partly because like last one Trier is quite famous for making weird and unusual and quite confrontational films um and this is sort of no exception to his his usual output and it's kind of got I think a, yeah sort of cult status amongst film geeks because last one Trier is this kind of interesting provocateur figure throughout his whole career it's also got a sort of cult status i think amongst horror fans because it is like unusual and really creepy but if you're interested in anything that's like deliberately non-conventional and can be like quite scary and creepy at times i would highly recommend you checking out kingdom yeah and i'll, I'll repeat this twin peaks comparison one last time especially because when i tweeted if i was watching it i did get a tweet back from the diane podcast which is an excellent Twin Peaks podcast, by the way, if you're in the market for one. I think I mentioned it before. Anyway, saying that, yes, they felt it was one of the few things that tried for that sort of surreal, vaguely Lynchian feel and actually successfully nailed it for the most part. So, yeah, if you if you do love Twin Peaks and want something vaguely Twin Peaksy to watch while you wait for that new season that's coming in May, and this, you could do a lot worse than Kingdom. It's good. Well, I'm glad you liked Kingdom. Yeah, uh, it uh, seems to have been a success. It's a really interesting show, so I'm glad we were able to get our teeth into it. But for the next episode, what will I be listening, watching, reading, eating that you can recommend me? Well, unsurprisingly, it's a comic, and we're we're doing we're following up on a, on a threat I made a few episodes ago. Now, in fact, quite a lot of episodes ago. Now, we are returning to the work of comic writer Warren Ellis. Uh, we covered the first chunk of his serialised novel, Normal, a while ago, and now we're going to do a comic. The comic, in the tradition of Kingdom, it's a comic that is quite creepy and kind of died off without being finished. But nonetheless, the eight issues that exist, yes, eight issues, just like eight episodes, are really good. It's called Fell. It's a crime series. The eight issues are collected in a book called Feral City. If anyone wants to read along, we are just covering the book Fell, Volume 1, Feral City, written by Warren Ellis and drawn by Ben Templesmith about a cop called Richard Fell who is dumped in an area called Snowtown because of an unspecified bad thing that happened where he used to be and finds that the crime there is a little bit creepier and weirder than he's used to. So, yep, we'll be reading now over the next two weeks. As I say, this did trail off a bit because... I think Warren Ellis had some sort of computer crash, and by the time he'd gotten vaguely back on to reproducing the scripts he'd lost, the artist had moved on or something. It was it was all a bit weird, but anyway, the series sort of trailed off, which is a shame because it's really good. So good that I'm going to give you the first eight issues anyway. Excellent. Well, I enjoyed Normal, so this would be interesting to dig more into uh, Warren Ellis's back catalogue. Tune in next time to find out what I thought. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for listening. And if you'd like more moderate fantasy violence, then please subscribe on iTunes so that you never miss an episode. While you're there, please leave us a review, as it helps us spread the word about the show and get other people listening to it. You can also find us on our website, moderatefantasyviolence.com, where you can listen to back episodes of the show, read extra content, and listen to our bonus clips under the name Excessive Fantasy Violence. If you head over to the website right now, you'll see an Excessive Fantasy Violence clip in which I talk about the BAFTA awards and what they mean for the stuff that we've reviewed on the show. Okay, and you can also follow us on Twitter as at MFE Podcast, where we post about things related to the show and also occasionally things related to general pop culture, such as our happiness at hearing that the OA has got a second season, which is good, Mm -hmm. because we liked that. And we're also on Facebook, if you search for Moderate Fantasy Violence, where we post news of episodes, scheduling and other similar things. So... I've been Nick Bryan. You can follow me on Twitter as at NickMB, or you can go to my website at nickbryan.com for blog posts, news of my self-published crime books, and so on. I've been Alistair Ball. You can follow me on Twitter at Alistair J. R. Ball, and find more of my writing at redtrainblog.com. Next time, we'll be discussing pregnancy-based thriller Prevenge, the new series of Inside Number 9, a new comic called Curse Words, and we'll be finding out what I thought of Nick's recommendations fell. Well, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. Bye.
last episode, I recommended that Nick watch Danish. Nick watch Danish. Mm. Two minutes. <laughs> In fact, there's only one episode. I recommend. There. Last last episode, I recommended that Nick have a nice Danish. <laughs> yes, I think we're all getting a bit too emotional. We need to chill. <laughs>